Okay, we, we have our, our final speaker of the afternoon, Pedro Westerdahl, is with us from Bukowski's uh, auction house in Stockholm. Bukowski's has a long and, and important history with Zorn uh, that, that perhaps our speaker will, will mention. And as I said earlier today, they funded our catalog, so we're very, very grateful to Bukowski's. Pedro uh, joined Bukowski's fine art auctioneers after earning a BA degree in art history from Uppsala University in Sweden. And for the last 12 years, he has served in various functions within the firm, primarily within the art department, where he's currently senior specialist of 19th century Scandinavian painting and sculpture. In recent years, he's played a very important part in the uh, several very high profile sales of Anders Zorn's most sought after masterpieces. Um, these, these works are, are coming out now and it's, uh, it's very intriguing and fascinating um, to, to see them reemerge and also to see the incredible prices that they reach. Um, and one of these works that Pedro is responsible for bringing out of hiding is the recently rediscovered uh, Reve, Boulevard Clichy, this, this uh, watercolor that's on the cover of our catalog that's now in a private collection. Please let's welcome Pedro Westerdahl. Uh, thank you, Jim, for your kind words. Uh, wow, uh, after all these highly educational and expert talks, one almost dreads taking to the stage. <laughs> I have, however, been kindly asked to um, give a brief introduction on the topic of how Zorn's work have fared on the art market over the years. And uh, given my professional background, I will of course focus on the auction market. It may seem a little out of place to touch upon the subject of money in the art historical context of today's symposium. But the fact is that Zorn, as we know, made a remarkable journey during his lifetime from a, if not downright poor, or as director Sed Lund earlier put it, Sorn grew up in humble circumstances, but not poverty. He nevertheless ended life a very rich man. In fact, according to official documents, Sorn's annual income for the final full year of his life, 1919, was given to be somewhere around 240,000 Swedish crowns. That would be roughly $620,000 today. If you take into account a variety of factors, such as inflation, you will surely appreciate how much more $620,000 was worth back then. I did some research before coming here, and I found out that a brand new Ford Model T automobile cost around $250 uh, dollars in the 1910s. So had he wanted to, he could easily have acquired about 2,500 brand new T-Fords <laughs> in 1919 alone. What he would have done with them in Muda, I wouldn't know. Perhaps starting taxi business. No, but the thing is, to point out or illustrate the actual spending capacity of his income back then. Sorn's deceased estate the following year was estimated at about 4.4 million Swedish crowns, which roughly equates eight million dollars today. You see here uh, a famous photo of Sorn uh, taken in what was then Constantinople during the honeymoon of 1886. Uh, he's still a young man, he's working hard to make a name for himself, despite some earlier success in Sweden, London, Spain and France. He made a living partly by painting society portraits. He had realized that if he wanted to come into contact with wealthy clients, he had to act the part, dress accordingly, and behave like a man of the world. As we know, he blended in beautifully with high society, and after gaining the approval of Emma's intellectual upper middle class family in Stockholm, he made important and profitable connections in London, as well as in Madrid and Paris, to name but a few places. And later on came his highly important trips to the US, seven in total, where they forged important friendships and made some serious money. 
I would argue that even though Sorn's fortunes were mainly based on his exceptional skills as an artist, another very important aspect was his talents and skills as a businessman who understood the importance of business dealings and also took quite an interest in the gradual amassing of wealth. Sorn became the darling of several wealthy patrons and art collectors in Sweden and in other countries, and uh, this gives you an idea of what a wealthy home could look like in Sweden in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, you must forgive the quality of the pictures because these are based on old photographs and I couldn't sort of enlarge them without losing too much of the quality. But what I want to point out is what a home would look like. And this is industrialist Axel Jakobsen's home in the prosperous suburb of Jusholm. This is the study and hanging on the wall from your left, you will first see The Unicorn, painted in Sorn's studio in Stockholm in 1906 and named after the 16th century woven tapestry in front of which the model is depicted. And I do believe the tapestry is still in the Sorn collections in Moda, yes. Uh, this painting is quite interesting, even though some people might regard it as a fairly uninteresting piece from Sorn's later period, the painting has had an interesting journey on the Swedish market. Sold by Bukowski's for 19,000 crowns in 1922, that was one of the first sales of a work by Sorn after his death in 1920, the painting returned to Bukowski's in 1979, at which time it set a record for the highest price paid for a Sorn when it made 230,000 crowns. It later resurfaced again in 2004, once again at Bukowski's, where it, much to my surprise, made a staggering 3,350,000 crowns, about $620,000. So not only has it increased its financial value about 700% in about 80 years, but it also shows that today's art buyers and collectors still seems to take an interest in this particular discipline of Sorn's, which often has been criticized for its emphasis on the naked flesh of the female models. There is even a name for it in Sweden where it is often referred to as Grosshandlarpor, or <laughs> if you prefer it in English, wholesale dealer erotica. <laughs> Since representatives of this particular occupation were said to be amongst the most common buyers of Sorn's late period nude acts, I suppose it could be disputed, but I can give away this little revealing detail. Uh, I had a look in Bukowski's sales records from 1922, and they are stating that the man who paid 19,000 crowns for the unicorn was a Mr. Nass, whose stated occupation, you see, Bukowski's always used official titles in the records back then, was, would you believe it, wholesale dealer. We also see two more pictures by Sorn, one of them being the lace makers from Venice in 1894 when Sorn and Emma stayed as guests of Mrs. Isabella Stewart Gardner at Palazzo Barbaro. This was sold by Bukowski's main competitors, Stockholm's Akumsverk, for $1,250,000 in 2010. We also see baking bread executed in Moda in 1889. And as if that wasn't enough, his drawing room displayed one of the versions of Une Première, as well as Midnight, painted in Moda in 1891, and now, once again, part of the Sorn collections, ever since Emma bought and retrieved it in the 1930s. Another example could be found in the abundant home of Consul Erik Brodin in Stockholm, who is in his drawing room held a celebrated collection of, amongst other things, early watercolors. Uh, it's hard to make out, but on the right-hand side, you will find one of the versions of the Kaik Osman from Constantinople, 1886, 
Girl with a Mandolin from Madrid in 1884, which unfortunately was bought in as an unsold lot during one of our sales last year, which could indicate that one, the estimate was set a bit high, $450,000, and possibly two, that these Spanish scenes appeal less than they used to to the art buying community of our times. Another view of the same room shows his much celebrated The Cousins, made in Cadiz in 1882, and the absolutely adorable Boat Race, painted in Dalarö in 1886. One of the highlights of the collection, however, was proudly displayed in the ground floor gallery, where we can make out one of Son's absolute masterpieces, if you ask me, Reflections, also painted in Dalarö, albeit a few years later in 1889, when Son had gradually more or less given up the watercolor media for paintings executed in oil on canvas. Upon Consul Brodin's death, it was sold at Bukowski's in 1940, where it made an impressive 23,000 crowns, despite worried times with an ongoing world war. When this masterpiece resurfaced on the market and was sold by Bukowski's in 1980, it replaced the unicorn in the number one spot as it set a new record for being the first really expensive picture by Sorn in an auction. To emphasize the importance of the painting, Bukowski's had decided to set a staggering estimate of 300,000 crowns, more or less unheard of back then. The actual bidding for the picture turned out to be one of the longest in the history of the company. In the end, there remained three competitors. Sweden's leading private picture dealer, a well-off old lady with a great passion for art, and a seemingly nondescript young man with long hair, squeezed in with the crowd at the back of the sale room. In the end, the young man was actually the last man standing, and the painting was sold for 860,000 crowns, roughly $400,000. Media reported the world record, which meant that the painting had increased more than 400% in value since it was last sold 40 years ago. What really made the news, however, was the identity of the buyer. The picture had been bought by a certain Benny Anderson, one of the four members of Swedish pop group ABBA, <laughs> which quite interestingly indicated that a new group of collectors was beginning to enter the scene. Up until then, the usual crowd at Bukowski's consisted of a small group of clients, mainly aristocrats, industrialists, or merchants, and this brings us back to Bukowski's in the beginning of the 20th century. The firm, founded in 1870 by Henrik Bukowski, a Polish refugee, conducted its first sale in the premises on Aschnallskatan in Stockholm, where we still have our main office, in 1882. Almost from the very beginning, Bukowski's came to play an important part for Sorn, as did he for Bukowski's not least thanks to Mrs. Sigrid Karlsund, managing director of the firm, seen here in Son's portrait from 1917, which still adorns one of the walls in our foyer. Mrs. Karlsund, who in her youth briefly had lived in New York, making a living working as a shop assistant in one of the large department stores, was taken on by Mr. Bukowski as a minor assistant. She soon turned out to be quite an asset for the firm, however, and one of the very few things Mr. Bukowski did not approve of was certain minor initiatives on her behalf, such as accepting and selling paintings and etchings by Sorn, an artist far too modern for old Bukowski's taste. One famous episode tells the story of how Mrs. Karlsund, despite fierce objections from Mr. Bukowski, 
display the Saunch, the large brewery, which is on display, I think, right now, in one of the main windows facing the street. The painting was spotted by the young collector Torsten Laurin, who instantly acquired it. Bukowski's interest in Sorn's work was further strengthened when upon Hendrik Bukowski's death in 1900, Mrs. Carlson was promoted and a few years later appointed managing director in 1905, which is also rather interesting that as early on as 1905, uh, we had a female managing director at Bukowski's and she surely must have been one of the earliest, if not the earliest in Sweden, as I've been told. And uh, I, I only wish that someone would write a book about this woman because she's quite extraordinary. For a number of years, beginning around 1910, Bukowski's were the only official retailers of Sorn's etchings. The firm guarded this monopoly carefully and all the other dealers and galleries, like for example, Keppel and Halo in New York, Kometer in Hamburg, or Konagi and Obach in London, had to buy their stock from Bukowski's. The prints came in limited editions, and as soon as word spread that someone was about to release the annual harvest of usually about five new etchings, the collectors were literally queuing up outside Bukowski's in order to sign up for copies of the new motives yet to be released. By this time, art historian and poet Karl Asplund had joined Bukowski's where they eventually took over as CEO after Mrs. Carlson. Beginning circa 1915, a routine developed between Sorn and Asplund, according to which Asplund on a regular basis took a taxi from Bukowski's to Sorn's studio in Stockholm. Asplund brought with him the latest check, usually amounting to quarter of a million or so, and was invited to lunch with the artist. In the lavishly decorated dining room adjoining the actual studio. In uh, Asplund's memoirs from 1962, he describes how on each of these occasions, a large beaker of schnapps, or Swedish vodka, was standing next to each laid place at the table. And Asplund writes, quote, Whoever felt any hesitation regarding this rather hefty morning ration was, according to the host, never again asked to lunch. End <laughs> quote. Asplund, never much of a drinker, however returned on several occasions, and he described them all as somewhat of an experience. It soon became common knowledge at Bukowski's that whenever Asplund had to deliver checks to Sorn, he was not to be expected back in the office until the following day. <laughs> and I am so glad that the choral entertainment we had earlier on actually sang that sort of schnapps song which is attributed to Sorn, because according to Asplund's memoirs, they actually sang that song each time he had to sort of down that beaker. <laughs> So now we all know what it sounded like, which is amazing. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Creator Gans describes in his entry in the current exhibition catalog how prices for Sorn's etchings developed on the international market. So I shall stick to the Swedish side of affairs. A few years after the breakout of World War I, prices soared on the Swedish art market. Sorn's etchings in particular steadily increased in value for each passing week until finally they had to be rationed. The etchings were considered a good way of investing money and many of the customers were, rather than collectors, ordinary workers or middle class citizens who considered the etchings a safer deal than for instance ordinary shares, stocks or bonds. The banks readily accepted Sorn's etchings as security when people came to borrow money. And it was not at all unusual for the banks to telephone Bukowski's to verify the daily course or asking price for a specific etching. Money poured in and the arrangement made a hefty profit for Sorn 
and Bukowskis alike. This horse lasted until recession hit the art market in the 1920s, when the demand for Sorn's etchings, until then, Bukowski's main source of income dwindled and more or less came to a halt. Each year, all of the sales included etchings by Sorn, fetching lower and lower hammer prices until absolute rock bottom was hit in 1935. A minor change became apparent in 1941, and the following year, the market seemed to have recuperated when the etching, the waltz, sold for twice the amount it had done the previous year. From now on, prices for Sorn's etchings would be back to a more normal level and remain there for many years. What about Sorn's paintings then? Well, the first ever sale of a work by Sorn at Bukowski's was a study of a child's head done in pencil, which was sold in 1886. The first work of actual importance was included in one of the sales in 1892 in the shape of this charming watercolor, painted in Richmond outside London, 1882. It was catalogued under the title Siesta and described as one of the finest works by the artist. The hammer price was 500 crowns. When this watercolor reappeared at Bukowski's in 1989, then titled In the Garden of the Hostess, it changed hands for a sum of 7,600,000 crowns, which means a minor increase in value of nearly 50,000%. By the time Sorn had passed away in 1920, Modernism has already started to establish itself in Sweden. A younger generation had returned to Sweden from France, where they had studied for masters like Paul Gauguin and Henri Matisse. These artists were followed by others who had studied for the likes of Fernand Rocher. Gradually, after some initial difficulties, these younger generations were taking over the Swedish art scene. Sorn was now more and more regarded as a thing of the past. His work fared well on the auction market, however, where many of the buyers still favored a more traditional kind of painting. Paradoxically, the two world wars were prosperous times on the Swedish art market. As one of the few countries in Europe outside each of these ghastly conflicts, Sweden had a functioning national economy which relied heavily on solid industry. Probably, due to the troubled times, the art buying segment seemed to look more and more towards Sweden as a nation and our own national heritage as a source of inspiration, which meant that typically Swedish artists, like Sorn, were sought after on the auction market. And I'm sure that import restrictions, etc., also played a significant part, obviously. In between these horrible wars, the art market suffered from the recession which appeared in the 1920s and later became what is now referred to as the Depression. After the Second World War, Sweden became subject to major change in general attitudes. Led on by progressive political powers, a new society was forged based on socialist principles, while still relying on the incomes from several major industries such as iron, lumber and other exports. This new mood meant, amongst other things, that more and more people went on to study at universities and so on. People started discussing subjects like gender, and quite a bit of the earlier Swedish art history was beginning to be questioned and challenged. Added to this could also be the major impact modern and postmodern art had had on the Swedish market by then. You see, Sorn's paintings was more and more becoming an interest for a few art collectors, with what could then be described as old-fashioned values and ideas. The fact is that the average prices for Sorn's paintings had increased very little from 1945 to the beginning of the 1970s. By the mid-1970s, however, things started to change. A new generation had appeared who realized that the auctions were open not only to the old aristocracy and industrialists, 
but also to them. This generation showed a very crass attitude to money, as well as art, and realized that money was to be made by investing in high quality pictures. And this was the beginning of the massive speculations in fine art, which were to increase during the 80s until the bubble finally burst around 1990. A good example is to be found in this picture, the Heinz from 1908. Originally acquired directly from the artist in 1910 for 20,000 crowns, the picture was later sold by Bukowski's in 1983 for a new world record price of 1.5 million crowns, which meant that its financial value had increased with about 350%. Uh, and here in this picture, you can actually see the gentleman who bought the painting. Uh, he was very much into speculation in those days, and stimulated by the rapidly rising prices, he, five years later, in 1988, admitted the picture for sale in one of Sotheby's Scandinavian sales in London, where it made an impressive 4.5 million crowns, thereby further increasing its value with another 120%. Obviously, this situation couldn't last, as we all know, and the market faced a crash on a magnitude previously unheard of, as is illustrated by this diagram. And I'm, I'm sorry, because I accidentally took the Swedish version, but it's quite self-explanatory, really. Uh, <laughs> here we have sort of uh, the amount of money on an average spent, and here you have the, the sort of the years. And we see from 1980 up till 1988, there seems to be no, no, no stopping it, and then it all sort of crashes down, and, and slowly, slowly, slowly recuperates in the beginning of the 1990s. <coughs> the crash was to a certain extent precipitated by the Scandinavian sales in London, which helped to raise the temperature on the international art market as far as Swedish art was concerned. One of the most impressive, if not the most impressive sale of a painting by Sorn was conducted by Christie's in London, who set what seemed to be an unbeatable world record for the artist when they sold the magnificent Le Begneus from Dalarö, painted in 1889. Originally in the collections of Jean Baptiste Faure in Paris, and described in the catalogue, as one of Sorn's most important plein air paintings, the picture was considered so valuable that they even used it for the cover of the auction catalogue. Needless to say, it sold for 1,500,000 pounds, about four and a half million dollars today, crowning one of the last of the successful Scandinavian sales in London before the market came to a halt internationally. And speaking of the Scandinavian sales in London in the 1980s, apparently they weren't quite as international as the auction firms in London would have us think. This theory is sort of backed up by Mr. Henry Avard, who as a specialist at Christie's was instrumental in creating the Scandinavian sales in London during the 1980s, and also was the expert who oversaw the sale of the Bagnes. Prior to coming here, I interviewed him about his recollections relating to his years at Christie's between 86 and 91. And according to him, one, most of the consigned works by Sorn were purchased by Swedes, living abroad or in Sweden. Two, the almost frightening increase in value for Scandinavian pictures, Sorn included during these years, were a result of the appearance of finance institutes and banks who offered to lend up to 100% of the cost of acquiring fine art. Three, the increase in prices were driven on by uninitiated amateurs, his words, with money to spend who couldn't and wouldn't distinguish between good, average, or even bad pictures, mm -hmm. as long as they were signed by the artist in question. This meant 
that when the market collapsed in the autumn of 1991, the effect was particularly hard on Impressionists, contemporary art, and Scandinavian art, all of these categories which had suffered severely from speculation. He also added that the strong market back then meant that a large number of works, mainly of them originally acquired directly from the artist and passed on within the family, entered the market during the 80s. And he also said that the most exotic discovery of a picture by Sorn took place in a remote farm somewhere in the outbacks of South Africa. When I talked to Mr. Avar, he also offered an explanation to why the works of Sorn wasn't as eagerly desired by the international buyers at the Scandinavian sales as the works of other Swedish artists like Karl Larsson. According to Mr. Avard, this could have to do with the fact that Sorn is probably the only Swedish artist that from an international point of view has not been entirely seen as a typical representative of a specific Swedish or Scandinavian movement or context. He has rather from an early point on been regarded as a part of an international movement along fellow artists as Soroya and Sargent. After 1991, it took about 10 years for the market to regain some strength. The current buyers also, unlike some in the 1980s, are more and more looking for the highest quality, which is evident in our current sales. It seems art collectors of today are more concerned with genuine quality. When something really good turns up, it definitely shows in the general interest. One good example is Sunday Morning, painted in Moda in 1891. This painting is well documented in literature. It's exhibited from an early point, not only in Sweden, but also in Germany and Paris, including the Salon of 1893. This painting was first sold at Bukowski's in 1935 for 15,000 crowns. In 1971, before the market grew strong, it was sold by our competitors for 69,000 crowns, which was basically the same value considering inflation and so on. When auction firm Bayesh in Stockholm sold it when the market was considerably stronger in 1984, the hammer fell at 2.9 million, which meant an increase in value of about 4,000% in 13 years. The picture was later consigned with Bukowski's in 2011 and was sold for 11 million crowns and thereby almost doubling its value over a course of 25 years, despite the crash in between the two last sales. I guess this serves to illustrate how the market has regained its strength when it comes to really interesting representative works by the artist. Obviously, this could be further illustrated by the recent sales of Man and Boy in Algiers from 1887, probably shipped directly from Africa to London by Sorn to be sold by one of his picture dealers there, and thereby more or less unknown to a large majority. It sort of reappeared in the summer of 2012 in London, where it was offered for sale far surpassing its estimate of 25,000 pounds when it sold for 85,000 pounds, about $130,000. A year later, it was consigned with me at Bukowski's, and uh, we had to set a far higher estimate, four million Swedish crowns, which seemed very high considering the result from the previous year's sale. Interestingly enough, it sold for 3.8 million, or about $600,000, proving once again a point, as far as Sorn is concerned, the strongest market in the world is to be found in Stockholm. That the current market really appreciates works by Sorn, especially his masterpieces, is further verified by the following two sales in Stockholm recently. The lovely summer vacation from 1886, which is now currently holding the world record prize for a picture by Sorn, when it sold in 2010 for $3.3 million. 
and obviously my personal favorite. Reveille Boulevard Clichy, painted in Paris in 1892, which more or less rediscovered, absolutely charmed the art collectors when it was offered by Bukowski's in 2012, and after fierce bidding sold for $1.8 million. Hopefully, the general interest reflected in the current strength of the market, as well as curatorial presentations like this impressive exhibition at the Legion of Honor, will sustain interest in the works of Anders Sorn, Sweden's master painter. Thank you so much for staying with me, and I wish you all a very pleasant weekend.